Great. Uh, welcome to the hottest, uh, I guess I can't even say hottest seminar because that's part of the seminar. Seminar is one of the uh, one of the letters in that acronym. But anyway, welcome to the hottest. Uh, we're very happy this week to have Felix Cherbini, who's going to tell us about a foundation for synthetic algebraic geometry. Uh, please take it away. Yeah, many thanks, Emily. Um, also to the other organizers for the opportunity to speak. So this talk is about an article which is joint work with uh, Thierry Cocon and Matthias Hutzler. And uh, at least my talk will be for the most part about this article, but I will also mention other things that are going on in the end. And I'll briefly um, let me say that uh, we are building, of course, on top of other work, and that could also be called synthetic algebraic geometry. I don't know if Ingo in particular did. So Ingo Blechschmidt wrote his thesis on synthetic algebraic geometry. I think he was more the term internal. And uh, so I think uh, it has two big parts. And the second part is very much related to what we are doing. And we're building on top of that. And also before that, decades ago, Anders Koch um, already used a similar setup, which is also related to synthetic differential geometry, if you heard about that. And uh, finally, in 2018, I learned from David Jess Myers a lot about how Ingo's work can be used in homotopy type theory. David himself never published something about that, but there are some old talks. If you are interested, they are linked in our article. And yeah, so that was very important prior work. And there's also a lot of surrounding work now building on top of our article and or mostly on top. And uh, it's done by a large group. If you are interested, you can uh, look at the GitHub repo we use for our drafts. So all most things there are like not in a finished state. So read at your own risk, but I guess it's very good to get some sense of what's going on. And yeah, it's in addition to the authors, uh, these people contributed and Hugo and David uh, did a lot of work on a lot of the drafts you can find there. So, which I'm very happy about that so much is going on. And uh, yeah, but let me tell you, uh, probably on the same page, what we are doing. So this is a pi picture I'm using for five years now, I think, <laughs> in lots of variations. Uh, so the general idea is not to redo algebraic geometry in hot, where we uh, use hot as a foundation and try to copy what would be in an algebraic geometry textbook, which we would have to do constructively and so on. So it's a bit harder than just copying or a lot harder. And uh, this is not what we do. So confusingly, this is something other people are currently also doing in the hot community, which relates to our work and which is very interesting. For example, Max Zeuner has a formalization even, even of a lot of the classical uh, constructions in algebraic geometry, but done constructively. And this is very interesting for us for a couple of reasons, but it's very different from what we do. So uh, for that, you can think of the somehow uh, often 
maybe advertised standard way to think of a model of hot in infinity group hots. And for algebraic geometry, you would mostly just use the H sets. Um, so that's how you would do copying of the classical stuff, more or less. And for our work, you have to think of bigger models. And there's this general theorem that hot can be interpreted by Mike Schulman in higher toposes. And we have one particular higher topos in mind. And we also do computations that some additions to the language we use uh, work, but not using exactly Mike's setup, but something more cubical, which I guess is well summarized by saying constructive the risky sheaves. And so it's about sheaves, higher sheaves on some side. And uh, we are not uh, interested in some big class of higher toposes, but one very specific one. And we want to use hot as a language. And we have, in addition to plain hot, some data and some axioms, which we know are valid in this model. So the data is just a ring. So that's pretty simple. And there's not really something to check. But the axioms are a bit more involved, which I will show you later. And uh, yeah, but they, they reach very far in producing algebraic geometric results, which we are interested in. Yeah, so they get us very far. If they are complete and really nailed down, this one topos, which we have in mind, is by no means clear. OK, and here I included this bubble with schemes, which are the basic object of study in algebraic geometry. And uh, we reduce our study to some particular kind. It's written down here in the small print that we only consider quasi-compact, quasi-separated schemes of finite type. And these are all finite res restrictions, but uh, I would say it's not a very heavy restriction in what we can do algebraic geometry-wise. So the, the things classically of interest are included in this class. And it's not so clear if we ever really want more. So OK, so it's a restriction one should keep in mind, but I don't think it's important so far. And a very important point is that a lot of things are finite. And it sometimes makes things easier than they are in synthetic differential geometry, which is very much related to what we do. So an important takeaway is that since we are talking internal with hot as an internal language about objects of this model, which we are really interested in, uh, our theorems and statements and so on sometimes look a bit different than classical results. and they also have a different meaning because in type theory you uh, show that things work in a context so you're automatically relative and that prevents us from just carrying over some things from algebraic geometry but yeah so far it's not clear if this is a bad restriction or not i would say so what wasn't clear to me like two years ago is if uh, how to Ingo it was probably clear that this works. But to me, it wasn't clear so much how intuitive the setup will be to work with. But by now, I would say that part is good. So I'm very happy. I can understand what I'm doing. So in that sense, it's not just a formal game in hot with 
Chatton's self interpretation in this topos, and also in the sense that we know that some things we construct internally correspond to the right external objects. So it's connected. Yeah. So now we view inside the internal language of this model here. And uh, this is the data. So R is a given commutative ring from now on. And uh, Algebraic geometry, well, it's about geometric objects. And here I make the vague claim that this B is a geometric object. So it's some set of pairs that fulfill some equation, which happens to be polynomial. And uh, objects like this are easier to deal with because if we only look at things that are described by polynomials, well, polynomials are kind of finite objects, also constructively. You might not know how many coefficients you have to consider, but it's only finitely many. So this is in some way something you can calculate with. And uh, the problem is equality. So if we kind of would forget about the geometric object behind this, so this subset of the plane uh, this is, which might look like a circle for some rings. Uh, if we forget about this geometric thing and calculate something with the polynomial and only consider polynomials, one question would be, when should we consider these things equal? And this is already a bit involved because we can just add or exchange this. Nothing changes. So we have still the same geometric object. And we could also like move this circle around, get a different equation. So uh, it's not clear how to do equality a priori, but uh, that's a nice way of doing it. So instead of uh, looking just at the polynomials, we can construct an algebra from that. So here you see the connection. We have two variables and we had two dimensions here and we have this equation, which is just moving that on one side. And uh, yeah, so we replace our geometric object by some algebra. And one direction is clear. We can recover V from this algebra by looking at homomorphisms. So if we use the universal property first of this polynomial ring, so mapping from Rxy into R, it's just pairs. So that's the first part here. So we would get all pairs. But if we take a quotient by this ideal generated by this uh, polynomial, um, we only get homomorphisms if the pair we picked for the variables fulfills this equation. So this is exactly V again. And this is a um, kind of coordinate independent way of representing something by this algebra. But uh, now the general story is, um, uh, I mean, I just generalize here. So algebras of the shape in general are called finitely presented. So there are finitely many variables and finitely many polynomials in these variables that are modded out. And I mean, if we transfer this to this representation, this means uh, we get something in R to the N and uh, L many polynomial equations have to hold. So we take the intersection in some sense. Yeah. And uh, in general, we call spaces, which are like this V, uh, spectra, confusingly, an overused word. So we say the spectrum of a finitely presented algebra, and we will here only use it on finitely presented ones. Uh, is the set of homomorphisms. And if we have a type 
which is of this form, we call it a fine or a fine scheme. So, but now the question is, or a question is, um, what about the other direction? So I can move from the algebra to the geometric object. What about turning a geometric object into an algebra in general? Well, if I don't have this representation, for example. And the answer is considering maps from V to this base ring. And then the question is like, is it an equivalence? And uh, the answer is we have to turn it into an equivalence and it happens to be an equivalence in our model. So we can ask this canonical map which says the algebra uh, is the same as the functions on its spectrum. We can ask this as an axiom. And uh, this is valid in the Zariski topos for this finitely presented algebras. Okay, and in comparison, in the classical setup, we cannot just do this. So if I'm in a classic meta theory and then have a ring, which has this property, uh, this will be inconsistent. So that never works. But I can go to a larger category where this is in some sense possible, but this is a quite involved construction and I have to do a lot of things and uh, bloat uh, my ring up to uh, some space with some sheaves on it. And, so on. So it's a lot to do then. And uh, here we can just have this axiom and uh, an affine scheme will just be a type. And functions, so scheme functions between affine schemes, we can just take as type theoretic functions. So this is very simple to work with in comparison. Okay, and what are the consequences? So you can just plug this in for a couple of obvious algebras. So if we just take a polynomial ring in one variable, we get a value in R for every, uh, yeah, for every homomorphism. And uh, so we just get back the base ring as its spectrum. And this means if we apply the synthetic quasi-coherence axioms, or it is called, we uh, get an equivalence between this algebra and functions on the spectrum of this algebra, which happens to be R again. So just functions from R to R are polynomials. And that is already pretty weird from a classic perspective, but makes it kind of tractable to do things with these general functions. Okay, couple of other things one could do. So this is something which uh, is kind of a general principle behind a lot of the proofs and something, at least for me, kind of surprisingly strong, but it's really just applying that spec is fully faithful. So if we know that uh, spectrum is empty or more type theoretically, if we know not spec A, then we know the algebra is the zero algebra. And in the case, say for a principal ideal in the base ring, we can use this uh, to conclude that the ideal must one uh, uh, must be the whole ring if we know this is zero. So in this example, if we know um, not the spectrum, which means not R equals zero, then we can conclude this is zero. So this ideal must be one. So R must be invertible. 
So this gives us that uh, non-zero elements in the base ring are not invert uh, are invertible, which is very surprising because um, maybe quickly going back, uh, this when we construct these Zariski sheaves, we can do this over any ring. And uh, we never put in that this is a field or something like this or uh, any properties at all. But here, all of a sudden, we get this invertibility. And what we also get is not invertible elements are nilpotent always. And if we throw in another axiom, so this is axiom two of three, uh, which says that the base ring is local, um, then we get an equivalence up here because this implies that zero is different from one. And then we can use this to show that uh, R equals uh, R different from zero if and only if it is invertible. And uh, more generally, it tells us um, that if you have a non-zero sum, then uh, one of its summoned must be invertible. This is kind of the strongest form using already this. OK, so. This, by the way, the synthetic quasi-coherence is something that already would hold in Zariski pre-sheaves. And this locality is something which happens to hold when we pass to sheaves. And uh, so naturally, it appears when we want to prove that uh, some co-limits are equal, that something is really a cover and things like this, but also in a lot of other cases. Okay, so let me just throw an important construction at you. If we have a, an element of some finitely presented algebra, then we can do the following construction, which is called D of F or denoted D of F. And um, it's the spectrum of the one element localization of A at this given element f, and which means that we force f to be invertible. And this can be constructed in this finitely presented way. So we add a variable and mod out this equation, which says f has an, as its inverse, this x. And uh, since finitely presented things like this over some finitely presented Algebra is in total, again, a finitely presented algebra. We this type checks, we can apply the spec as defined. And uh, from the universal property here, we can calculate that these are exactly, so read this as a sigma type, these are exactly the points in the spectrum for which the point applied to this element is invertible. So the point was a homomorphism. So we can apply it to an element. And on the algebraic side, this is easy to compute. And uh, this is, in spirit, uh, really applying f to this point, because we can also think of this f by synthetic quasi-coherence, by this equivalence. It is the same as having a function on the spectrum, values in R. And then this D of F is all points where F of X is invertible. And as we just learned, this is the same as all points where of F of X is different from zero. And if you look at this and think a bit about topology, this is uh, something that looks like an open subset, a set of points where something, some function continues, doesn't vanish. And it is uh, in algebraic geometry, also an open subset called standard open. 
or some particular one and they form a basis. And uh, in general, we are now for this purpose here in the talk, I will call a finite union of, the, of things like this, a global open. So I give it a weird name because open, I really want to define in a different way. And later then I will show, uh, want to show that uh, it's the same as this one, just to differentiate the two actually equivalent notions. Good, and one fun thing to note here is if you have a couple of functions, elements of the algebra, and then you might want to ask, uh, do they do their D, Ds, <laughs> their standard opens cover the spectrum? And it turns out this is the same as asking that together they generate the one ideal, which means something like having a partition of unity. And yeah, this is an incarnation of a more general principle. You can also use a proof if SQC or read in our article. Okay, so how do I really want to define open? I want to do it for propositions first. So I also added the definition of closed, but let's focus on open. So an open proposition, and here I don't just put one element into the D, but finitely many. So think of this as a union already. So it's built in from the start to have unions. And I just, uh, take it to be the OR of uh, elements of the base ring. So this is just from the base ring now, elements of the base ring being non-zero. And this is a particular kind of proposition. And then we can define the type of open propositions as propositions, which are merely of this form, D of some finite list of elements. Okay, and if you know, happen to know synthetic topology, then this might look kind of familiar to have a type of open propositions. Uh, then you can define open subtypes of any type X as maps into this type of opens. And this is something we need because the next thing we want to do is to talk about uh, types which are covered by affine schemes, but by an open cover. So we have to speak about opens of a type. And so far with the other D of F, the big one, the global definition, we could only talk about opens of affine schemes. Okay, uh, yeah. So. Now, a question is, uh, are those definitions the same, at least on something affine? We can now ask this question. And to answer the question, we need our third axiom, which is called the risky local choice. And it's called like that because it is a bit like an axiom of choice, but it also holds internally if you don't have choice in your meta theory where you do everything. So it's a lot weaker, and uh, but very useful. And uh, one more diagrammatic way to depict it is for any affine scheme, if you have a surjection into it, then uh, axiom of choice would say you have a section or you merely have a section to the surjection and uh, our Zariski choice tells you you have a cover of standard opens and on each piece of the cover you have a section. And the difference is that you might get sections which don't glue to a global section like you would get from the axiom of choice. But yeah, and this is related to the VISC uh, axiom, which you might have seen, which is a bit similar in spirit. 
Yeah. Okay. And here is a more type theoretic formulation. So, which I guess is also good to once look at, I guess. So, if you have a dependent type on spec A and it is merely inhabited at any point, then uh, there merely are a natural number, a list of elements of A such that the Ds cover the spectrum, then you have a section, a dependent function on each piece of the cover. Okay, so let's try to apply that. So this is the goal. And so a subset is open in the pointwise sense with the open proposition defined if and only if it is global open and uh, jokingly called a pointwise global principle alluring to local global. And uh, yeah, uh, not completely a joke because uh, having something pointwise nearly is a lot like having it locally, which we are told by it's a risky local choice by this axiom. Okay, so to reduce uh, to some special cases, we can use here that um, openness is kind of transitive in a way. This is also a condition that appears in synthetic topology. So if you have an open subset of some global standard open thing, uh, then it is open in the whole space. And this is something um, one can just, uh, so for global open, so say this maybe some DG again, then this is something you can just compute by algebra. So this will be, this G will be some element in the localization and you, uh, it's some element in A divided by F, and then you can just take this element in A and figure out that this one does it. So this is algebra. And once we know these things are the same, we can kind of use algebra to figure something out about this pointwise stuff. So it's very important that they are the same because the pointwise stuff would also not really work without it. So yeah, so how to do this? The interesting part is taking an open, uh, which is global open and, ah, uh, no, which is normal open and showing it is global open. And uh, more or less what we have to do is just feed it into the risky local choice. So this is just a reformulation of what it means to have an open subset. So at every point it's open and this is merely this data. And uh, let's just forget about this natural number and assume we can choose a global one, which you can by some other theorem called boundedness, but let's just forget about it. And uh, then the risky local choice kind of lets us remove the merely or move it to the outside and uh, have an actual function and from here, we can just use projections to get functions to R. So from the DFI, but as we noted in A, that will be enough. So once we have seen that our UX on some standard open DFI is open, we are good. Yeah. Okay, so from here, just projections and everything is good. So it's essentially done by local, it's a risky local choice modulo this boundedness thing. Okay, so it's a good definition and we can go back and forth. And in particular, we can use it to define schemes. So a type is called a scheme. If we have an open, finite cover such that each part of the cover considered as a type by sigma up is an affine scheme. And I guess the most important example in classical algebraic geometry or major example of interest is projective standard space. 
And um, this is one construction, which is a lot like classical textbook constructions, um, which don't work as easily in advanced algebraic geometry. Uh, but here it just works. So we can take a set quotient or actually also a homotopy quotient, if we like, um, just of points in Rn plus one without the origin and mod out the relation that two points are on the same line through the origin. So, and uh, Morally, this means this is the space of lines through the origin in Rn plus one. And here also, it means that actually, so we can uh, just show that this is the same as lines through the, oh, that's, ah, no, I said submodules. So that means it goes through the origin and it's of dimension one. So lines through the origin. And uh, we can show it is a scheme by taking an equivalence class and um, yeah, so this is a point here and it we know it's non-zero. So we know one xi will be non-zero or invertible, which is equivalent. So we know this UI will be a cover. And yeah, maybe what I left out a bit is, well, first we have to show this is actually a definition with this invertibility, but it's invariant under this relation. So this is good. It's just induction of the set quotient hit. And uh, it is open because it's invertibility of a number. So. That's good. And um, yeah, it's a cover because of localness. So this axiom, which said we have a local ring, tells us that uh, if some vector is non-zero, one of its entries must be non-zero or invertible, like we wish. And so we know this UI will cover this whole space. And uh, the hardest part, at least in the formalization of this one, was actually to show that it is uh, a fine. The UIs are fine because you have to do something with indices and finite sets. So that was the most stressful part. So this is very nice and easy. And we get that we have schemes like this. And uh, it's also easier than uh, what is externally done in the approach, which is closest to what we do, which is the functor of points approach. And uh, that's a bit, yeah, I don't know. It's a bit intransparent to define scheme. And yeah, here it just works. And we have nice examples. Also closed subsets will be schemes again, because schemes are actually closed under sigma types. Okay, what is also something which is very easy to define, and this is kind of one point where we uh, are lucky that we have dependent type series. So this is easy to define what the type of lines is in general, like one dimensional R modules. And then we can define line bundles, which are uh, very important geometric objects, uh, just as maps from a scheme into this type of lines. And uh, we have a wild group structure on this type, which carries over, which is also kind of easy to define with the tensor product and taking duals by homing. And uh, it's also nice to uh, define examples of line bundles. So for example, in the case of the projective space from the last slide, uh, we can just take a point which wrap 
presents a line and map it to the line generated by this point. So yeah, this is very nice. And um, yeah, not in this article, but in general, we have some results of our check homology, which uh, we expect lets us repeat all the classic computation about line bundles and their cohomology. Yeah, so in general, this truncated type of lines, line bundles is called the Picard group, and it's an instance of a cohomology group. So the type of lines, if you look at it, is actually a de-looping of the automorphisms of uh, this as an R module, which is the invertible elements or GL1 of this ring. So the type of lines is a K R times one, which means it's a connected pointed one type whose loop space is uh, R times as a group. Yeah, and that's exactly how we define cohomology then mapping into an einberg mclean space like this, de-looping and truncating. So in general, we take a dependent abelian group as coefficients and um, define the cohomology as taking the pi type and then set truncating the whole thing. So taking connected components, so to say. So this is something, at least when you have constant coefficients, you have just a mapping type here. And this is also how uh, cohomology is defined in hot, as many of you know, uh, in the context of synthetic homotopy theory. So something you can use in, um, uh, to mimic algebraic topology. And the same definition of it surprisingly works for uh, schemes, which are zero truncated. So usually you put in stuff here, which is maybe not even end truncated. And the interesting examples usually are spheres, which have some homotopy level, some truncation level above zero, but this definition turns out to also make sense for um, yeah, zero truncated objects. So, but first, what is good about that? So it's very nice to work with this definition. I mean, classically, you would do something, a lot of homological algebra and uh, derive a functor and so on. And you have some non-canonic constructions, which are not clear how to do constructively. Synthetically, all of these things, but here it's like very nice and you can also do a lot of things with this very nicely. So it's just the pi type, you have just this set truncation modality and uh, you have actually homotopy groups. So you can rewrite this as a homotopy group in various ways, like for every K. And this tells you it's an abelian group and you can reuse a lot of theorems about homotopy groups, like long exact sequences and things like this. So it's possible to take, import a lot of hot and just prove a lot of abstract nice theorems, which would classically be quite some work by transferring that. Okay, but why is it non-trivial at all? I mean, for a set, uh, my favorite explanation for this is what one can keep in mind, um, that if you have a push out of sets, or if you have a set which happens to be a push out of sets, sets for example, if you have embeddings, a span of embeddings, then uh, the recursion property from this push out uh, can tell you something about its cohomology with constant coefficients. So yeah, what is a map out of this push out? Well, it's two maps on the parts of this cover, so to say, which have some witness of being equal 
on the intersection, this y on the middle of the span. And uh, if we assume that we kind of have a cover of our x and the parts have trivial cohomology, then this part is not relevant. And this is an equality between the point in Ka1, more or less. And uh, then this datum H, the only relevant datum, is now a map from Y to the group. But that can be non-trivial. And that kind of tells you how uh, U and V are glued together in some way where you compare identifications in your X with identifications in the sense of uh, elements of this group A. Okay, maybe this gives some intuition. For me, it took a long time to understand why this actually works with sets, but I mean, this is also one reason higher topuses are so interesting because you can do this. Yep. Okay. So I have a question just from my own intuition, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, so these, these types are covered by sets somehow, and then the gluing data ends up being put in by this push out, which is higher data. So somehow the set, the set itself is remembering the sort of homotopical data of like a, like a simplicial like check complex or something. Is that maybe how I'm supposed to be thinking yeah, about it? Roughly, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. that's thanks. Cool. thanks. Yeah. Okay, and uh, ah. So, uh, yep, yeah, good. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, I mean, the next question is, I mentioned you have all these uh, nice abstract theorems. And as I also mentioned, you have kind of a check cohomology, which in some sense generalizes this, uh, or makes this formal, this intuition about the push out for an iterated push out or bigger finite cover. And this allows you to compute cohomology from some cover where you know the cover has trivial cohomology, the parts of the cover, the intersections, and so on. Um, but you need this triviality to get started. And in our case, for schemes, what we need is triviality of cohomology for affine schemes. So, and it fortunately holds. And this is actually, uh, I guess, one of the important new points in our paper was that um, uh, we managed to prove a result like this. And this Zariski local choice axiom was actually invented uh, to prove, to be able to prove something like this. And this was for a long time, to me at least, very unclear if you, or how you can do this internally. Okay, so what's the setup here? We have an affine scheme. And as coefficients, we have a module where we when we compute cohomology, just forget the module structure and take the underlying abelian group. And we need some extra condition, which roughly tells us that it behaves a bit like a sheaf, a bit algebraic, this module. I mean, so far, this is a, a very general thing. So externally, that would be something like a, module object in the slice over X and it could be anything. It could have a scheme structure as well and whatever. So it's uh, different from the usual classic setup where you have uh, a sheaf of modules on a space and calculate cohomology from that. So they are the, yeah, it's kind of a locally constant somehow bundle. So it's some restriction. And here we also make some restriction, but yeah, it's at least to me, uh, it's not so clear how it relates to the classical thing, but uh, it works very well. And we have the relevant examples. So uh, I'm happy also if it doesn't match something classical. Okay, yeah. So how is this 
proved. So H1 is a set truncation of some Sorry, pi type, which I yeah. Um, can you just clarify that last axiom? Is that for every f, or there's a there's a little? Uh, yes, axis. this is for all f. I see. Okay, thank you. No, for all f uh, of type A. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so this H1 is the set truncation of this pi type, and uh, that it's zero means it has only one connected component, so we want to show it's connected, which means uh, we have to show uh, any such element in this pi type is merely equal to the trivial thing, which is given by mapping everything to the point in this pointed type. Okay, yeah, and uh, we have something which looks kind of similar. So since all these types at each point are connected, we have this. So at any point, we have this uh, truncated thing. So passing merely from the lower one to the upper one would be an application of the axiom of choice. So that's not the way to go, but we have our Zariski local choice and it merely, but that's enough because we show a proposition, gives us a cover. So F1 to Fn, such that the these cover the whole space, such that we have the triviality on each part of the cover. And now the question is, can we glue this, or can we somehow produce a global trivialization from this data? And uh, the answer is yes. And how do we do it? We first try to turn it into something algebraic. So by looking at this, so this means we construct a function which pointwise kind of moves from this point star into this tx and then back again. So we have a loop at star and by the property that this deloops to mx, uh, this means we have an element of this module. So this tij is a function into uh, this module, a dependent one. And uh, it's uh, not only just any collection of functions, but we have a relation which just comes from these things being defined as differences. So if you plug this in, uh, you, yeah, you just plug it in and cancel out and then uh, you have this relation. So it's a co-cycle, classic parlance. And uh, we have something algebraic now in the sense that we have a function in this pi type. And with our requirement up here, we can turn it into a an element of a localized module. So in the end, at this point, we have a question. So I haven't phrased the question yet. So the question is, can we adjust these SI in a way that makes these differences here disappear? So these TIJ are the obstructions to gluing these SI together to a global S, which would give us this thing. Yeah, okay, so we want to make this one zero. We have turned the obstruction in the form of these functions with this relation into something in modules of this form. 
And uh, then there's an algebraic result, which is a bit of a computation in these localized modules, which tells us that um, uh, whenever we are in this situation, we get functions which with values in this module or elements of a localization like this one really, such that the given things are just differences. So if you know the check complex in, uh, yeah, the check complex, so this is uh, exactness at index one of this complex. So we know these are given as a difference and now we can use these functions. So they have values in MX, which means they define a loop here. So we can use those functions UI to alter the SI. So here then written as SI tilde. And uh, if we look at the differences again, so if we plug that one in here, then up to sign errors I might have made, <laughs> um, we just get zero. So the SI tilde uh, glued together to a global trivialization. And this means we have shown this. So we have produced a witness S tilde of this one and we showed connectedness. Okay, um, yeah, oh, I'm done to, ah, no, oh no, I forgot to, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, results of the larger project. So now skipping to the bigger picture, what is going on in all those other drafts we have on our project page. So this theorem has a generalization, which tells us that HN, uh, is trivial for all n greater zero, uh, which uh, was possible by a nice trick discovered by David Verne, building on stuff for check cohomology. Um, yeah, uh, maybe that's all I want to say for this. So, but also very happy about this one. And uh, this one is a result by David Verne and Ingo Blechschmidt, which tells us that also the converse holds if all first cohomology actually only vanish, then X is already a fine. So this is a nice analog of classic theorem. And um, I'm especially happy about it because it tells us that we can use our cohomology that we internally defined. So this is a use case. Uh, yeah. And um, this one I should explain. So we have one abstract uh, model kind of related to a modality definition of smooth schemes. And Hugo mostly alone has shown that it is uh, something which we can describe very explicitly with equations, what it looks like. This is also something I'm very happy about because it tells us this abstract definition works very well. And I'm also happy that we can could do so much internally in this case. Yeah. So um, what we also have is a notion of properness, which is very important in algebraic geometry. And the interesting, important part uh, is the notion of compactness, which is the same as Martin Escado defined in synthetic topology, which is the property of a space that uh, pi over an open proposition on the space. So the proposition is, if an open is everything, is itself open again, which means it's in a way determined by finitely many numbers. So there's some computation behind it. This is again something David Van has done, the most complicated part of, I would say. And then we uh, have 
also tried out A1 homotopy theory. And yeah, this is just something I picked. We also are confident about the more general thing about Grossmannians, if you know that. Um, and yeah, uh, just to finish the round. So Hugo has also found a very nice uh, idea candidate for an FPPF topology, if that tells you something, and uh, shown that schemes are sheaves for this topology. And we also have things about Dillon, Mumford, Stacks, and yeah. And that's everything. So thank you. Great. Uh, so we do our traditional silent applause. All right, uh, thanks, Felix. Who wants to start us off with questions? I've got one. That's all right. Go for it. Yeah, I was wondering about the the semantics, uh, the the constructive Zariski sheaves or infinity sheaves that were in quotes uh, at the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is it some sort of simplicial sheaf on Zariski site, or what? What do we? What is it? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would expect and hope that uh, it works for classical uh, simplicial sheaves. So I would be very surprised if it doesn't. But I mean, what we used here is a model is uh, cubical sheaves. And the background is the stacks uh, paper of Kerry, uh, Christian Sattler, and Fabian Bruch. Does it answer your question? Yeah, so it's so it's essentially cubical sheaves on yeah, it's cubical. Zariski. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I don't know at least uh, if it corresponds homotopy theory wise uh, to. Simplicial Zariski sheaves, how you would define it classically. Yeah. But I mean, so far it didn't play a role because the homotopy theory is relevant for the uh, cohomology. Yep. And the cohomology is a bit off anyway, and we use it as a tool. So, uh, one point about the cohomology I maybe should have mentioned is that it behaves a bit different than the classical one. And it has to, because it has to have some base change stability that the classical one doesn't have. Right. And I was a bit afraid about that, but I mean, by now we see that it's useful. So, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll see the floor. <laughs> I've got further questions because this is interesting, but yeah, thank you. Hi, um, Felix. Uh, thanks for uh, that great talk. It's a really interesting stuff. Uh, this program. Hi, David. Um, yep. Thanks. I was wondering. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, you were able to prove that the projective spaces are compact. Um, wh what sense of compact is that? Um, ah, I know, it's. I know a paper by... Yeah. Sorry. It's. Um... So, yeah, I don't know where I'm going, but um, the very last slide I mentioned in the Martin Escado sense, which says uh, uh, pi over an open is open, and it's a bit related to the algebraic geometry definition where you say images of closed things are closed. There you have an exists over closed is closed, something like this, and this. It's kind of a, you could view as a dual version, which happens to work better synthetically. Great, that's uh, that's great. Um, it's, uh, are, are proper maps, can they be defined point by fiber-wise? Can be fiber-wise compact? Yeah. Wonderful, awesome, Thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, for proper, you say compact and separated, 
but separated just means that uh, identity types are closed propositions. Yeah, I have a question, which is, you announced some A1 homotopy theory result, and I was curious how you connect this framework to A1 homotopy theory, given that you work with uh, the, the risky oh. side. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so um, what we do uh, is, uh, or what we did here is that we just ignored that we are not on something more reasonable for a one homotopy theory like uh, uh, Nisnevich sheaves over smooth varieties over field or something like this. And um, it changes a bit what happens. This is also something David already told me like many years ago that, um, for example, you don't get that a times or r times in our case or a one without zero is local but there's some infinitesimal thing going on you wouldn't see on the nisnevich side so this is one example where you can see that things are different um yeah but you can actually just adjust that one so you have to uh, apply some weird modality which we call formally et al replacement and other people have called co-reduction or infinitesimal shape or yeah, has many names is a bit weird to understand. So I don't try to explain it now in brevity, but you apply this modality and a times kind of stays the same in rough shape and uh, that's then actually local. So you have to remove the infinitesimals in some way to make it work. But uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of things just stay the same. But I mean, this is just to announce we, we are also exploring this. We don't have a result where I would say we, we've really shown that this is the way like to do things like this. Or that certainly not. We don't have computations of some K-series stuff or something like this. So, okay, but essentially you localize a one in in shifts with the risk topology. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, uh, what might be interesting to look at is the CDH topology instead of the uh, Nisnevich, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, one point I maybe should mention is that we can, in the beginning, we asked ourselves, do we want to do the same stuff maybe for the etal topos, like the big one, and where you have etal covers instead of the risky covers. And uh, so the choice axiom you get, so that's the part that changes. And this other choice axiom is... Um, I don't know. So I didn't feel comfortable with using this. So it's more complicated uh, because your covers change. And so we kind of thought it's probably better to do everything internal to the, the risky topos, or sometimes maybe even internal to the risky pre sheaves. Um, so uh, I mean, we, we can kind of do the A1 localization and uh, sheafification for some uh, finer topology at the same time. So I don't know if that makes sense. So we can still uh, use maybe the CDH topology later and see if that helps us when we get at a point where we would actually need the nice properties you get from these special topologies for a one homotopy theory. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I had a question also. Actually, I had a question and a comment, and I think the question kind of got answered. Um, what the question was going to be if you consider doing 
like a Nisnevich or a tall local version instead. So you would have a like a stronger axiom about your your ring R, but a weaker covering condition. So it sounds like you've already have considered this to some extent. So the atoll topology. Okay. Uh, um, sorry, I'm not sure I understand what the yeah. So is. if you replace the Zersky site with the sort of a tall equivalent, then now R would be a strictly Henselian local ring. But on the other hand, you would not have a Zariski local choice, but an Atoll local choice, which is a weaker condition. Yeah, so that's something yeah, that you right. So like. this is uh, probably something one could do as well. Maybe it's yeah. fun. Uh, I haven't explored it personally. And um, uh, yes. yeah, so uh, just doing it internal seems to be the easier way. So. Uh, I mean, I don't know uh, how much known this is, but you you can just define sheafification internally, and oh. it's actually pretty nice. So you can just build it as a nullification modality at a family of propositions. Right. It's known that you get something left exact, and you can use this to do the sheafification internally. So you can just internally try to define at all maps and come up with some condition when they uh, should cover something and then uh, force the fibers of those covering maps to be merely inhabited. Um, okay, and, and then as I said, uh, Ingo, uh, not Ingo, Hugo has uh, work on the FFPF topology where or a synthetic candidate for that, where he does this very nicely. So there's a draft about this early draft, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then the comment I want to make is about on the slide, which was called Zersky choice in cohomology, and you had this condition on an, on a a module or yeah, yeah. So the, the beginning of this. So I thought or assumed first of all that if I externalize M, first of all I get a a sh what when ge algebraic geometry is called a sheaf of OX modules, but just like an arbitrary one. And that the, the condition that you've highlighted is the condition that it's a quasi coherent sheaf of OX modules. Is that, and, but it's not the same definition, the same form you'll find in like, it, I don't know, it's for some reason this definition is not easy to find in these places. But exactly, you should say that localization restricting to a, to a basic open is implemented by the localization. Is that, Something that you, uh, uh, you I mean, we, familiar with, or uh, uh, I mean, we actually call modules, yeah. which has a uh, which have a property uh, which implies this one. Uh, we call them weakly quasi coherent uh, because uh, I mean, externally they are quasi coherent in some sense. So, uh, but. Um, yeah, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, I don't fully understand it yet. So um, Ingo in his thesis also has a condition which is called strongly quasi-coherent, okay. but uh, these actually don't form an abelian category and the weakly quasi-coherent uh, do. So Ingo, uh, I guess, came up with this strongly quasi-coherent definition to capture quasi-coherence over the base scheme of your topos in this case, actually. So he works over a scheme, not just a ring, so to say. And uh, yeah, this is good for that. And the weakly quasi-coherent ones is something which I reinvented. So Ingo also had this in his thesis. And I reinvented it first to prove the theorem and do other things, and they actually form an abelian category. But uh, just by uh, so they are just found by uh, need like needing some nice class of modules. And yeah. So I mean, our mod is like, internally it's a, a category. So externally, it's some stack of categories on the site and. So is it so is it identified with the, the stack of OX modules? And then likewise, 
for whatever notion this is, for example, is there a type that would classify those things? Like, um, does that make sense? Like inside our mod, you have some applications. I don't know, and I wouldn't expect uh, if it coincides in any sense with external OX modules on a scheme. Maybe Ingo is around and has something to say. I know he's someone thinking more about these things. Okay. Thanks. No, don't see. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, uh, at I, one point, I guess yeah, I can I make this. Uh, yeah, uh, I have two um, two questions. One is in a more, uh, I guess, more intuitive question. Uh, out of the three axioms used in your um, in your paper, uh, one is locality, which can be thought of as well. It is a property of the ring. Uh, one is the rate local choice, which is uh, uh, which can be thought of as a property of the universe. Really, I mean, it's um, something that at least in some foundation, I guess all. All rings have it. So on this spectrum, where does um, where does SQC lie? I mean, should we think of it as a property of the ring or a property of the universe or something in between? Uh, sorry, uh, where does what lie? Um, I think I didn't hear uh, what you asked. Uh, okay, sorry. I guess I was talking too quickly. Um, out of the three axioms you um, introduced in your in your paper, uh, SQC, uh, the risk of local choice, and locality, one of them, locality, is clearly a property yeah, so of the of the ring R. Uh, one, the risk of local choice, is um, more. At least I think of it as a property of the universe. Uh, which one? I mean, is SQC more? Uh, a property of the ring, or something that would, or, or something that under the right foundations would expect every ring to satisfy. Uh, no, I, I mean it's a extremely special property of a ring, and uh, I mean it's a property we can ask of a module in general. So. Uh, this is uh, Ingo's general synthetic quasi-coherence. Yeah, so it's a property of a ring, I would say, but uh, it holds only for very special ones. I mean, classically for none. And the example I know is this R in the Zariski topos. Okay, so uh, second question, um, uh, where, uh, where can I see um uh, where can I find the existing work uh, on uh, extending this to higher rings? I mean, I know this is still um kind of far away, but is there existing work in that direction? Uh, not by me. I mean, um, I would expect that axiom two holds for higher rings, but I haven't found it in the literature last time I looked. And, but I guess just because no one is asking the question. And uh, I mean, we don't work with higher rings because we can't say monoid, higher monoid internal to what. So at least not in an easy way. And this work is really about making something easier, maybe by accepting that it gets weirder, but it certainly is lower in complexity than the classical approach to algebraic geometry. Yeah, so if I would take some two-level type theory and things like this to include higher rings, uh, that would defeat my purpose for now, I guess, until the day where I really urgently need them to do something, but. All right, that answered my question. That answered my question. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, well, I was invited to pontificate a bit by Emily earlier, so I'll be <laughs> I, I really, I just want to sort of emphasize this local choice principle as an idea. As far as I can tell, I haven't seen it in the in the internal logic literature before this project. Um, but as a point of sort of history in that direction, uh, uh, 
Martha Bunka and Eduardo de Bunka had a, uh, had a principle in one of their papers in synthetic differential geometry called the uh, covering principle. And that said that, uh, that if you had two subsets of the smooth real numbers whose union was the whole real numbers, then their interiors also covered the, the real numbers where interior was defined in, a, in the normal metrical sense. So um, that, if you take the sort of naive analog of the, uh, of the Zariski local choice principle, where you, um, you would say like metrical local choice. So if you have a surjection by any type of the real, of the smooth real line and synthetic differential geometry, there exists local sections on an open cover, a metrical open cover, perhaps even a countable metrical open cover. Um, and uh, uh, if you did that, then you can quickly imply, uh, uh, imply this, uh, this covering principle. And that covering principle turns out to be really useful for a lot of things. It's one of these sort of secret axioms uh, that you, you see all the time. So uh, I think that's really interesting. And I imagine that the same kinds of arguments you use to show the vanishing of the cohomology of affines could be then used to show that the uh, sort of the, the triviality of bundles of R which uh, uh, is, um, is kind of tough to do in just pure synthetic French geometry with the design method to build the work in the exact same way. So sort of but I think that's very exciting. And I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm now I'm on the lookout for all these other local choice principles and what you can do. Yeah, thanks. So I was, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the comment, yeah. Uh, I mean, this is also something I'm wondering about, what this implies for synthetic differential geometry and what has already been used. Um, yeah. And uh, there's also um, implications for synthetic differential geometry in this work on smooth schemes. So... I guess yeah. there needs to be some exchange. <laughs> yeah. But I, as I said in the beginning, I think some things are easier to figure out actually in algebraic geometry because of this finiteness of lots of things one can assume and still do a lot of stuff. All right, any final questions or comments? I'll make one final comment. Uh, sorry to the Omer, is that the, 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 the synthetic quasi-coherence axiom as a special property of the ring is, is really a property of the generic ring the universal ring, the one in the classifying topos for rings, which is the example that, that Felix is, is using. So it's a very special property of rings. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and Ingo has a preprint uh, suggesting that a certain generalization of this axiom, a very logical generalization, sort of characterizes what it means to be the universal model of a theory from the internal perspective. So, so in some sense, it's really about that. Yeah, thanks. All right, I think let's wrap it up here. Uh, thanks again to Felix and thanks for everyone else who participated in the discussion. All right, uh, we will be back in two weeks. See you then. Yeah.